Is this working? Okay. Yeah. That looks good. Okay. Well, I'm glad to be back in Wisconsin. So I went to school here for my grad grad studies, and uh, that was about 10 or 15 years ago. I, I went to my first energy fair, so I'm glad to be back. That's awesome. So okay. So first of all, yeah. can everybody hear me in the back? It's all okay. Okay, let's see this. Okay, I'll try to speak a little louder. Okay, so first of all, who's uh, who's seen uh, the TED Talk? Quite a bit of you, but for those who haven't seen it, I'll play that again. So it's a, still a great overview of the work that we do, and I'll tell you about what the progress has been since then, and a little bit about myself as far as what led me to do that. So let's get started. So the concept here is about creating the open source economy, a collaborative economy, where we simply unleash innovation by open collaboration. And that's, that's the underlying theme. Uh, as far as some contact info, the, our main site is opensourceecology.org. Follow us on Facebook, Open Source Ecology. We put regular updates there. If you'd like to see some pictures of the recent events and some of this brick press, pressing, it's, uh, we, we Facebook quite a bit. So, and then you can contact me, Marchin, at opensourceecology.org. So this is our Facebook page. Um, let's start with the TED Talk. So now we need to get the sound. Can we have sound? Sound, please. OK. Hi, my name is Marcin, farmer, technologist. I was born in Poland, now in the US. I started a group called Open Source Ecology. We've identified the 50 most important machines that we think takes for modern life to exist. Things from tractors, bread ovens, circuit makers. Then we set out to create an open source, DIY, do-it-yourself version that anyone can build and maintain at a fraction of the cost. We call this the Global Village Construction Set. So let me tell you a story. So I finished my 20s with a PhD in fusion energy, and I discovered I was useless. <laughs> I had no practical skills. I mean, the world presented me with options, and I took them. I guess you can call it the consumer lifestyle. So I started a farm in Missouri and learned about the economics of farming. I bought a tractor. Then it broke. I paid to get it repaired. Then it broke again. And pretty soon, I was broke too. I realized that the truly appropriate, low-cost tools that I needed to start a sustainable farm and settlement just didn't exist yet. I needed tools that were robust, modular, highly efficient and optimized, low-cost, made from local and recycled materials that would last a lifetime, not designed for obsolescence. I found that I would have to build them myself. So I did just that, and I tested them. And I found that industrial productivity can be achieved on a small scale. So then I published the 3D designs, schematics, instructional videos, and budgets on a wiki. Then contributors from all over the world began showing up, prototyping new machines during dedicated project visits. So far we have prototyped eight of the 50 machines, and now the project is beginning to grow on its own. We know that open source has succeeded with tools for managing knowledge and creativity, and the same is starting to happen with hardware too. We're focusing on hardware because it is hardware that can change people's lives in such tangible material ways. If we can lower the barriers to farming, building, manufacturing, then we can unleash just massive amounts of human potential. That's not only in the developing world. Our tools are being made for the American farmer, builder, entrepreneur, maker, we've seen lots of excitement from these people who can now start a construction business, parts manufacturing, organic CSA, or just selling power back to the grid. Our goal is a repository of published design so clear, so complete that a single burned DVD is effectively a civilization starter kit. I've planted 100 trees in a day I've pressed 5,000 bricks in one day from the dirt beneath my feet and built a tractor in six days. From what I've seen, this is only the beginning. If this idea is truly sound, 
then the implications are significant. A greater distribution of the means of production, environmentally sound supply chains, and a newly relevant DIY maker culture can hope to transcend artificial scarcity. We're exploring the limits of what we all can do to make a better world with open hardware technology. Thank you. That was in 2011. So what drove me to do this? Just a couple of personal notes. I come from Poland uh, at the age of 10. So it's a small country with a lot of powerful neighbors. We do have a long history of war. And my grandmother was in a concentration camp. My grandfather was derailing German supply trains. This was in World War II. And those kinds of thoughts kind of stuck with me. So when I left Poland in 1982, this was the scene in my hometown. So this is not a parade, this is a real scene behind the Iron Curtain, time of scarcity. But then things got better. Moved to America, went to Princeton undergrad, and then University of Wisconsin-Madison for the grad school, and that's where I discovered that I was useless. <laughs> but at the same time, that's the last year of that program, that was, I think, 2004, I also started the, the Open Source Ecology Project which is essentially what happens when open source meets ecology, meets economy. It's a new paradigm, new, new way of thinking about things. So then we moved over to, to Missouri, to Maysville, Missouri, and began to build. By 2011, we had the, the eight different prototypes. Then we continued, such that by the end of 2012, we had, had about 60 prototypes, including about a dozen replications in five countries around the world. So the first one was a guy in Texas, who James Slade, who downloaded our plan, built our machine. And when I first saw that, I thought it was a Photoshop of, of our brick press. But no, that's him, the real plans, the real blueprints, downloaded, made into a real machine to press bricks like these right here. There was a number of other replications of the green machine that's in the state, a power cube, a universal power unit, hydraulic power unit tractor that was built by a group of high school students in Pasadena. There's a tractor attempt in Guatemala. There's another brick press in Italy. One all the way across the world in China. And so on. So, so the, the concept is about bringing appropriate tools to make life easier. Because I believe that true freedom really revolves around our individual ability to, to convert those abundant resources out there to free ourselves from material constraints. So that's a game that humanity has not mastered. The artificial scarcities have manifested itself in wars and poverty, hunger, and many ills. A lot of different, different issues from personal to political are still determined by material scarcity. And now because we have transcended, I mean, we don't have any limits in terms of how we can how effectively we can survive and thrive, um, that kind of scarcity that we see today is something that's not really natural. It's pretty much human-made. So what to do about it? Well, what we do in our work is publish these open blueprints. We, we continue refining the machines, providing good tools for everybody in the world, and really optimize the <laughs> in 2012 the build of the brick press which, where we achieved a single day build with a group of 10 people. So that's, that's how this looks. Uh-oh, okay. Up on the volume a little bit. This is similar to what we did just the last few days actually as we take the breaks here. We had even more people this time. We had about half the team dedicated to documentation so that we could produce blueprints that anyone else can use and improve on. So as we were going through this process, we're actually adding value to the documentation. We pretty much worked in Google Docs, Google Presentations, online, where we continuously make improvements to the blueprints and publish them for free so anyone can use them. So that's, uh, sorry for the internet here. That's the basic basic idea. Um, let's see. Yeah, we'll, we'll continue going. So that's the just a couple of words on the machine. So our brick press, 
is uh, we call it the Liberator. And why? Because it liberates you from the main cost of living, which is your housing. So you can produce, with this machine, you can produce up to, up to 10 bricks a minute, which is about 5,000 per day, which is enough for a small house. The machine itself costs about $4,000 in materials, including the full automatic controller, including an Arduino controller. Everything is open source. You can actually download the files to make your own circuits for this and also to cut your own case. We have a transparent case. We like to be transparent for the electronics. And you can pretty much take everything there is and without, without you doing the work, you can either give this to a local fabricator, you can download the, the computer-aided control files for a cutting table, for like a CNC cutting table, and you can make this quite readily. Now, the price is 4,000 materials. We sell these now for $9,000. The nearest competitor with the same throughput machine would cost you about 52000 So there is a, a real economic case for making these open source blueprints work, which means that we're simply taking out all the different competitive waste out of product development, such as the design process, which, which costs a lot of money otherwise, but we're collaborating with many people, such as, for example, a designer of another brick press worked with me. I mean, I pretty much told him, okay, I'm doing this open source project. A lot of people are quite willing to, to contribute their expertise to make things happen. So it's a cost-effective way to do things. So back in 2012, we were on the version four of the Life Track. That's, the, that's our open source tractor. In 2013, we built the next version, which is Life Track 5, which is now being used in an urban gardening project in New Orleans right now. And since then, we've done a few more things. We built like this is Life Track Five. And okay, I do want to show a few of these. Can we make this faster? Hi, <laughs> Life Track Six, a saw pulverizer, an upgraded brick press, laser cutter. We're just continuing on prototyping all these different machines. Uh, last year we were on Life Track version six. We built out this this laser cutter. So for example, if you see, take a look at our machine that's uh, in the natural building area. Uh, we're going to be pressing some more bricks today. We can Iron see the controller, backhoe, and trencher. Iron worker, backhoe, trencher. Then we showed a proof of concept of how our open source tools can work in harmony. So last year we, we've shown how the tractor, brick press, salt pulverizer, and power unit can work in harmony to build a comfortable, affordable home, which is the, the micro house, a small structure that we can build in about a week. And, and we're optimizing that, optimizing the design, publishing everything. So we're seeing the whole, whole string of events from actually making the machines to using them in real, real conditions. And the, the goal for the end of this year would be to build the brick press, the build the tractor, and then build the micro house all in a and single week. So we'll see if we can pull that off. This is Life Track 5 in New Orleans, doing some, some work, moving things around. We have demonstrated radical optimization. So last year we introduced, re reintroduced this kind of a modular Lego-like construction method. You see it's a basically box beam tubing, which can be used for the frame of the tractor. For, I mean, we're using that in a, in a trencher, in a backhoe. Uh, we're actually doing a CNC torch table now, made with this kind of same frame. We've done the iron worker, which, which presses with about 100 tons to cut the sheer slabs of steel. So we're seeing that this kind of method could also work for high force applications. Like this iron worker, which took us about six months to build, which you see in the picture right now. After simplifying, just radically redesigning it and still making it work out of that box beam tubing, we were able to build it in about 12 hours. So it's just crazy optimization that we're seeing. And it's working. And that machine, for example, is able to keep like seven thousandths of a blade gap in this whole process. So this applies to a lot of different heavy machines, semi-precision machines. And as you see, we pretty much, um, like I said, basically a box with wheels. I mean, the modular wheel units, you basically take out a couple of bolts, put on the wheel units, you can interchange with different power units. Like, for example, the universal rotor is the wheel in one, one form and it's trencher rotor in another. 
it's a highly flexible building system, literally the life-size Lego set for making real technology happen. And that's, that's the goal, to, to have a small farm or somebody, a producer, be able to handle their, their equipment base without that running them out of business. That's the concept. So, so this is last year's uh, prize. This is uh, the brick press in the back of the micro house. It's got siding on it because the bricks themselves are not stabilized. We're just using a straight earth from the site, right from behind the house there. And you have to protect that from water. So you can do things like siding, or you can do overhangs, or you can stabilize the bricks with cement. Like, like this brick here is stabilized with about, about a pound of cement to about a 10 pound brick. And that becomes pretty much water resistant. You can leave that outside as an outer, outer facing wall. And this, this is once again about empowering people to do the things that they want uh, with. When you really think about it. Okay, can we get the volume up on that? So um, the concept we're relying on here is that I mentioned the word artificial scarcity. So the first thing we have to consider, and this is an energy fact here. The, the sun throws at us, at the whole surface of the Earth, about 10,000 times more power than we use, even in our wasteful economy. So that tells us that the energy basis, I mean, we're pretty secure on that, and then it's a matter of converting those common resources out there through technological means into the life stuff of modern civilization. How do we do that? All of the wealth that we enjoy today for a modern standard of living relies on rocks, Soil, sunlight, plants, water. Those are all abundant, yet the productive mechanism of society is what makes it scarce, artificially so. That's, a, that's an interesting point to make, because once we can master the provision of all the goods and services to society, we start thinking about different things. What's really important in our life? And I like to refer to Daniel Pink's TED Talk on this point, he has a talk about the surprising science of motivation, which says that it's not a bigger carrot on a stick that drives us, but much more fundamental values, and those being autonomy, mastery, and purpose. Those are the fundamental drivers in all of us, whether we know that or not, and it's something that a lot of us here are in touch with. Um, Today, literally, the power of a microfactory is under our hands with advanced technology that we have today. Um, if you have seen 3D printing, for example, that things like 3D printing are making that very clear for, for many people. You can, this is Lowe's bot open source 3D printer, which you can materialize things out of code, out of computer code, which is pretty spectacular. And for me, personally, my life has been changed when I built the first tractor and just saw the power that, that we can all have in terms of our, our ability to produce the things that we need and to survive and thrive. But most of the world doesn't think like that. So did you know that in 2012, Apple and Google spent more on patents than on research and development? That's an outstanding figure. So that tells you about how much competitive waste still is out there because you can imagine what would happen if those resources were spent on solving, solving wicked problems, pressing world issues that are still there. It's an opportunity that we're bypassing a little bit. So we like to talk about the open source economy where we don't worry about patents. We give away everything. We're radically brave to, to share the things that we have in terms of the, the knowledge, uh, product design, everything, because we believe that everybody can, can win. Building and with that kind of approach. Evolving the extreme. So right now, we're, so we're producing machines, we're Manufacturing producing... Manufacturing techniques to a revenue model based on educational production workshops. So, so the way we're trying to go about this, I mean, we can produce machines. So just uh, as an example, um, we had a workshop on a brick press similar to what we have now, and we, we actually sold the machine and then we also collected revenue from the tuition. So we're pretty much hosting workshops, selling the machines, and trying to use that way to, to bootstrap the project further. We've been on some foundation fund funding before, but that, of course, is unstable. You can't really scale a project to a worldwide movement on that, I don't think. So we're trying to develop the real blueprints, the real machines that work. We're going to be hosting these, uh, like the next Brick Press workshop in about a month. We've got a, 
power cube workshop, a micro car, micro house workshop coming up. So that's all. Uh, all these things are coming up through the workshop model, and we we're finding that you can create a, a socially pleasant uh, collaborative production, social production. The concept where a group of people get together under the guidance of a skilled person, skilled guide, and then we can actually build these things just like we did with the brick press over the last three days, largely with people who have never done welding before. So, so we're just pretty much stripping the barriers to participation in our technological process. We call that extreme production. Well, can this ever scale? So this is what we're exploring. Let's compare it to the traditional business model, which says that good artists copy and great artists steal. As Picasso said that. I mean, that, that means that we're all building upon all the tons of knowledge. We're standing on the shoulders of giants to, to build on what society has developed over, over its history. Now, today, people also think that in the main business, the mainstream business model, that we also have to prevent others from stealing from us. Well, that people like Jobs, Steve Jobs say that. Um, and that's one way to look at it, but, but we turn this thing upside down, and uh, our, our model includes two points. One, still, still the fact that we build on all the prior work that's available to us, but also we think that the greatest artists help others steal from them. So what's that mean? I mean, that simply means that we foster radical collaboration. We're not afraid to give things away. First time anyone ever clapped at that. <laughs> that's interesting. Okay, that's that's our goal here. We're saying that if we give something away, many other people can contribute, and with the good energy that comes from that, more people are actually willing to contribute back into the pool of common knowledge. And that's our method. We're we're proposing that as a way that innovation can simply be accelerated towards the open source economy where. Imagine, I mean, companies did not compete with one another to have the better product. I mean, imagine everyone had access to the best design, best practices, and that continued to be developed as a collaborative effort between, between everyone. Well, that's the kind of paradigm that we'd like to see in this world. That's what we're working for. This year, we're doing various workshops. So, so far, we've had a workshop on the microhouse, on a brick press. We also had a 3D printer workshop. In the second half of the year, we're looking at doing a, a tractor building workshop. And we're gonna try to build that tractor in a single day. Uh, a CNC torch table. A torch table is a machine that lets you cut steel by computer control, such that you can produce all the parts for a tractor or the brick press readily, like within hours, and then you can just weld and assemble. We're also considering a a laser cutter workshop, we'll see how far that goes. But basically, a lot of different workshops on different topics. I also mentioned the microcar and uh, the power cubes. We're actually adding these workshops in collaboration with other people. And we're also doing, basically, the model is if, if you'd like to, if anyone out there, I'll invite you, if you'd like to collaborate on a workshop with us, we'd love to do something like a 50-50 revenue share in the workshop regarding the tuition and all that. So, so it's a model that we're trying to, to scale and get a lot of different people to work with us as a scalable way to, to improve the research and development effort because anybody who ends up hosting a workshop or building the machines, they, they end up contributing to the effort in some way, to the design, different ideas. It's, it's the collective effort that, that makes it powerful. Now, how do we do this? How do we achieve this single-day build? So we, we do what's known as module-based design. So we break down our machines into all the different modules. Like, for example, the, the brick press. It's made of the main frame. It's got arms, legs, hopper, soil loading drawer, the hydraulic system. So we pretty much break down the machine into small parts, and then people can develop them, all the parts, in parallel. And that's a way to accelerate the effort if you have a large group of people. So what we do is, um, if you go to, um, this is actually our Dozuki platform, opensourceecology.dozuki.com. We have all our 50 machines up there. When you go into each machine, it's broken down into all the different modules. And then for each single module, we go through all the different development steps, everything from the concept design to the bills of materials, the, the CAD files, 
instruction and videos and everything else that comes into making a single single module or a machine. So we develop on the module level so that we can break down the problem into many little parts. So like Wikipedia, you can have many, many people co collaborating on a project. This is another example of module-based design that's another project out there called Wikispeed. So they've broken down their, their car into the, the main frame, the wheel units, the interior module, the, the the air shell, and things like that, bumper module, so that once again, if, if a large, you have a large team, all the people can build this in parallel and then assemble it rather quickly. So that that's basically how we're we're seeing that collaborative production, where people get together in these workshops, can produce many of the things that would otherwise be relegated to perhaps some slave labor in another far country. So that's a good idea. Now, on top of this module-based design, we also follow the construction set approach. So that means that instead of just designing one item, we design a construction set for that item. So like for the tractor, it's not really a tractor, the, the LifeTrack 5 plans, it's really, we're really more after a LifeTrack construction set where if we design a tractor by using similar principles, you can enlarge parts, so you can make a micro tractor, a bulldozer, a truck, or truck tour a uh, back or other implements by using a set of common parts like the interchangeable power units, interchangeable wheel units, modular frames, and many other components that can interchange. Because we're trying to see what's the mi absolute minimum set of parts that can get you to create an entire infrastructure that can make society thrive. That's a worthwhile experiment. We're just trying to determine what that is. So when, when we look at any single one of our machines, it's not really that machine itself. It looks like that because it's got relations to many other machines, and sometimes that's pretty hard for people to grasp because we're not just designing one machine, we're designing for the entire set. So that's a different design principle. Now, there is encouragement regarding the, the collaborative development process. If we're able to break down the machines into all the different modules and then break down each module into all the different design steps, uh, well, if we got to do that as good as Wikipedia, which has about a half, it's like a, they get about a half a million articles per year. Well, if one of our design points was equal to a, a, a Wikipedia article, then we'd be done with the entire project in like half a year. So as far as all the 50 tools being developed. So that's, I mean, there's hope, but it's really hard to get a large collaborative effort going like that. You're talking about um, people using... I mean, you're using real materials which have costs and people have different tools and uh, it's just a much more complex process than just software or information development. But because most of this is information, you can treat it somewhat like the Wikipedia problem where you can break it down into many, many parts. So if we can succeed in breaking down our project into understandable tiny parts, then many people can contribute. Little details about all the development steps. Uh, okay, I show this picture. This is um, this is actually a connector. I just want to make a point here. This is a connector from a 3D printer. Once again, from the Lulzbot open source 3D printer. So this is a technical, like a graphical technical explanation of all the parts. Uh, pretty much, if you had this in front of you, you can go look at the table downstairs, source the parts from different manufacturers, and you can build this. But the cool thing about it is that it's open source. There's a license on the top right, top left corner there, which says that permission is granted to copy, distribute, and modify this document under terms of the Creative Commons Attribution 4.0 International Public License. So basically, it's a license, an open source license, which allows you to, to use these plants, to build this, to sell it if you want. And we're particular about licenses that there's CC, so that's Creative Commons, by means attribution. Um, SA, share alike, that's the license we use, CC by SA. There's another license that's, that says NC, which is non-commercial. We don't really like that because that means you can't actually make a living off of this. We want people, all our plans are open for you to produce them as well, so that if you want to earn money from this, you're welcome to do so because that's a great motivator. You've got to make a living somehow. So it's good if it's in, a, in an open source way, an ethical calling. This is a little bit of our calendar that's a little old here. So this is um, this is an overhead view of our site here. 
our facility. We've got 30 acres in the middle of nowhere, Missouri. This is Maysville. And uh, here's our main, main workshop, our house. This year we're getting a little bit of agriculture going. We've got an orchard. We're building a lot of different infrastructure this year still. We're building more micro houses. We're building a second workshop, a campground. So there's a lot of construction going on. We're, we're continuously developing the infrastructure to make it comfortable for people. Uh, also, uh, one note, I, I started the True Fans program a, a number of years ago when, as, I, as you saw in the pictures, I was broke and I needed some money. So I basically published all the plans online, started a blog, and uh, started a True Fans program where people are donating a small amount per month to the project. So right now we have about 300 or so contributors like that. Um, that also helps the project, so you can, you're welcome to subscribe to that as well. Uh, you get 25% off our workshops if you subscribe as a true fan. Little plug for that. Um, yeah, so, but I mean, that's about all I have. Um, so the bottom line is about uh, collaborative development for accelerating, the, accelerating innovation. A lot of times uh, in the early days, people associated this with kind of like hunker and bunker so survivalism or like end of the world scenarios, environmentalism or whatever. But the applications of this are, I mean, are many. It's like, we're just providing the tools. There's applications to all kinds, all kinds of areas, from environmentalism to resilience to just making a better economy in general by getting everybody involved in that process and lowering the barriers so that every, everyone can win. So thank you very much. And I'd like to take some questions if anybody's got any questions. Hi, just wondering if you ran into the Whole Earth Catalog. It was back in the 1970s. Of course. So that's some of the seminal reading for anyone in this trade. And uh, we're pretty much the, I guess, the extension into the open source realm. I mean, they're, they're pretty much open source into sharing information. But yeah, absolutely. That's, that's what we need. The best tools and practices in this, in this day and age, that to us means open source. Yeah. Place? Do you have a place where... Folks can suggest projects, such as a sawmill. Why the sawmill is already in the set. <laughs> but as far as suggestions for projects, uh, we have our wiki where people, it's pretty much our sandbox where everybody is free to, to input material. And if people have stuff that surfaces to the top, I mean, pretty much we, we talk to those people and collaborate with them further. Um, but we don't have really have, like, for example, I, I could point to local motors as a, basically local car manufacturing and a workshop similar to ours. They have an excellent platform. We can contribute design and all that. But that takes a lot of infrastructure. And, that's, I mean, that's a full blown out effort. Like, Wikipedia has $30 million in their budget to create their platform. We don't have, I mean, we're like 100 times less than that. So um, it takes money to, to organize that. But that's definitely something we need to do more, an excellent platform for collaboration so all the, all the valuable ideas are captured and developed. How do you deal with um, uh, liability issues, say somebody builds your uh, product with your plant? Yeah. Uh, what, what happens or how do you, how do, you deal with it? Right, so right, right now, okay. okay, so right now we simply have a disclaimer about using this, that, these things at your own risk. So the products that we produce, I mean, they're pretty much kits where the person participates in the whole process, so it's literally like you built it yourself. Now, as far as the rigorous treatment of that, I mean, we haven't run into any issues yet, but it's something, uh, like, if we're just a producer, then definitely have to spend all this money on liability insurance. But by doing the kit approach, we're going to get away from most of that. And if people build it themselves, I mean, they take the liability, you know, after our disclaimers for taking the risks associated with building any serious machines. Yeah. Let's see. There's a question up front here. Okay. Yeah. Do you happen to partner with any organizations like Tech Shop for open source production, if you've heard of them? Yeah. Uh, yeah. Or open or crowdfunding? Yeah. Uh, Et cetera. Okay, so you do have... Yeah, absolutely. So crowdfunding, I mean, we did one of our earliest campaigns on Kickstarter. To generate like sixty thousand dollars for the tractor, like basically the Civilization Starter Kit version 
0.01. We published initial plans for the tractor, brick press, pulverizer, and power unit with that funding. As far as Tech Shop, yeah, they're next on place. They're actually offering us to use their facilities. Uh, we've, we've had a little bit of contact with them. And for us, we're trying to generate all the tools like a tech shop, like an open source tech shop, um, so that one of the applications of our work is putting together local prototyping facilities just like tech shop, but with all the open source equipment instead of the more costly ones off the shelf. Yes, uh, this is all on-site equipment, right? It's all used on-site. I wonder, transportation and housing for this, and then also for the brick maker, you said it produces enough bricks in um, how many minutes to, you know, uh, produce a house in a day. Mm -hmm. Now, also, the places where these things are constructed, um, how about the labor force? How many hours of labor, manual labor, mm -hmm. uh, with these pieces of equipment, if that were translated into mm -hmm. manual labor? How many jobs or what kind of uh, employment could that provide for people in, in lieu of, uh, you know, yeah. standard production? Yeah, right. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I think because the plans are open, I think the, the co collective effort of all people who can take the plans and run with them to, to get into production, my claim is that that could rival mass production. It's not... Not mass production in the sense that one company makes a billion of some units, but that billion people make one of each, or a thousand people make a thousand of one thing. So I think the potential is that by distributing that power to many, many people, you end up with, with uh, good ideas like Jeffersonian democracy of all days. That's, that's the, that taken to the modern day. Okay. Hello? There we go. Yeah. What about... Uh, producing in areas where infrastructure is really destroyed, like say yeah. after the Haiti disaster, how could you say partner with nonprofits or something in order to get down there since there is such an excess of labor mm -hmm. and a need? How do you have any ideas about that? I don't know. I'm just thinking. Yeah, about that's, I mean that's a topic that comes up all the time. Um, so my response on okay, going to a place without infrastructure from one sense. We'd like to have more of the different tools of the set created before we were to, for example, take this down to Africa because once something breaks, you're not going to have parts. So my general response to that is, okay, well, let's wait till the induction furnace or metal melting capacity comes in so we can generate our own virgin steel from scrap. So we'd like to have more of our tools as the collective, the, the unified set before we want to go somewhere and set up shop elsewhere because if we don't have the supply chains, which we have here, we still can't do it. Right now, we're relying all on the pretty much off-shelf parts until the point where we start making, we're starting to make some of our parts, but just about when you start, you have the chicken and egg problem. You have to start with what exists. Yeah. Irene? Um, we're hiring collaborators in the sense of partners where if, we, if you want to get involved in organizing workshops, I think there's a significant revenue model possible there. I think... Uh, you know, say, say, I mean, just the numbers on a workshop, if we sell a machine in a given workshop, that's $5,000 revenue. If there's tuition from, say, 24 people paying, like, $400 for a typical workshop, it would be, like, almost 10000 So, I mean, there's significant earning potential there. We're thinking that that way we can invite people to collaborate, develop, risk share with us, um, because we're trying to evolve the, the organizational model. Not, I, we don't want to just start another big Walmart or like GM or something. And that's, that, if we approach it from the, the approach of, I mean, just a lot of hiring and all that, being, becoming a big bureaucracy, we're trying to be really careful about what that looks like. So right now we're pursuing the model of, of the, the workshops and collaborators who join us, partners. So invite any of you here. For that. Okay. This is the last question. Okay. How do you prevent somebody from patenting some of your, what you're doing? If it's not patented, what's the protection? Yeah, so the license we use is Creative Commons CC by SA. The share alike clause in there means that if somebody uses our plans, they have to release it back into the open. So that's one way. So basically, it turns out that if, if you publish something, whatever you've already done, you cannot patent. That's for sure. 
And also, if, if you do use our plans, you are forced, you're required legally to, to put those back into the common, common pool. But I guess the real legal cases for that haven't really been tried with open hardware. That's pretty much a new field. So that's yet waiting to be tested in the courts as far as what, how it really plays out. Yeah. Thanks, okay. Martin. One more round of applause, Martin. Martin and the open source ecology crew built it in the green home area, demo area. There are workshops happening all weekend long, uh, and you can go back there and check it out. It's almost 2 o'clock, so make sure you make it to your next workshop, and thanks, everybody. Thank you, everybody. We collaborated. We stopped it. Yeah. Okay.